Good afternoon and thank you for coming. As you know, the um, midterm elections are coming up in November. And uh, what we're going to talk about today has an impact on those elections. So I wanted to make a few remarks about those elections and why what we're talking about is so important. First of all, I think it's obvious to most pollsters that the Republican Party, which controls the House of Representatives, will pick up at least six more seats uh, in the impending uh, November election. This is true for a number of reasons. First of all, the Republicans controlled uh, the redistricting process in most of the states uh, starting in 2011, and those districts will stay in effect until 2021. And so many of the Republican districts are safe where the Democratic districts are at risk. Secondly, uh, people generally in the polls say that they hate Congress, but they love their congressmen. And they don't pay much attention to much else uh, on those uh, races that are down the ticket, and that tends to help incumbents, and since the Republicans control the House, they're likely to stay in control of the House. But the third factor, and the one that's most relevant to what we're talking about today, is that in the Citizens United case, the Supreme Court allowed corporations and unions to put more money into elections than they had before, and that tends to favor the Republicans because corporations tend to be a little richer than unions. And so it looks like the Republicans will maintain control of the House of Representatives. The Senate is much more interesting. The Senate is now split 55-45, 55 for the Democrats, including two independents that vote with them, and 45 for the Republicans. So if the Republicans can pick up six Senate seats, they can take control of the Senate. They're pretty much guaranteed that they're going to win in Alaska. They're pretty much guaranteed that they'll pick up a seat in Montana. They're pretty much guaranteed that they're going to pick up a seat in West Virginia due to the candidates and circumstances that have taken place there. So they're halfway home. Then things begin to get complicated. In North Carolina, the Republican has the lead over the incumbent Democrat, but she's making a race of it. In Louisiana, things are even more complicated because there, you have to win with 50% of the vote or more. There are four candidates for Senate, including the incumbent Democrat and leading Republicans. The feeling is that in a head-on-head -head race, the Republican might win, but that on election day, none of the candidates will get a majority of 50%, and therefore, there will be a runoff which will take place in December. So we might not know who won the Senate until December. If that wasn't complicated enough, we can now go to Georgia. Sonny Perdue is leading the race there to take the seat back uh, from the Democrats and, and hold it for the Republicans. However, that's another state where you have to get 50% of the vote to win, and if you don't get 50%, it's a January runoff. So we might not know the results of the Senate, who controls it, uh, until January. Then races in Iowa that looked like they were safe for the Democrats now are dead even. The race in Michigan, which looked like it was favoring the Democrat, is now very close. The race in Colorado, which looked like it was favoring the Democrat, is now very close. In all of those races that I've talked about, these are called the targeted Senate races. That's where the money's going to go, the money we're talking about today. So it's important to look at Citizens United and the impact it will have in November because of the fact that it is very likely that the Senate is going to be right on the margin of becoming a majority. Should the Senate split 50-50, as I'm sure you all know, then the Vice President of the United States decides which party is the majority party, and we know where, what he will do. Uh, Joe Biden, the President of the Senate and the Vice President of the United States. Before I begin my formal remarks, I want to thank the Long Beach Press-Telegram, the Department of Political Science, and the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication for co-sponsoring this event with us. I also want to thank uh, Provost Dowell uh, for asking us to do this again. I believe this is the sixth time we've done this uh, at the behest of the, uh, the Provost uh, to celebrate Constitution Day on our campus, which is required by the state legislature. I also want to welcome uh, Dean, Dean David Wallace, uh, sitting in the back there, who uh, is uh, kind enough to join us today. Uh, he is the dean of the College of Liberal Arts, which is uh, much harder than herding cats. If you're watching television right now, particularly PBS, Ken Burns has a documentary series that's brand new on the Roosevelts. One of the most important Roosevelts was Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt uh, rose to fame for all kinds of reasons. He fought corruption in New York City when he was police commissioner. He uh, was an assemblyman. He eventually became uh, uh, prominent in, in, in the Port Authority. 
Uh, he decided when the Spanish-American War broke out uh, that he would put together a troop of friends and go into that war to make up for the fact that his father had not fought in the Civil War. He became a hero on the island of Cuba by running up San Juan Hill, bullets whizzing all around him. He was even wounded. He came back uh, and became governor of New York. Uh, and then fate continued to bless uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, in 1900, the vice president of the United States, uh, Garrett A. Hobart, died. And so when the Republican convention met in 1900, they had to put someone new on the ticket. Mark Hanna was the fundraiser for the President of the United States, William McKinley. He raised more money than anyone had ever raised for a presidential election in 1896, and William McKinley had won that race. Mark Hanna didn't like Teddy Roosevelt. He called him a damn cowboy. He thought that Teddy Roosevelt was too progressive and would hurt the business interests that Mark Hanna represented. They went to the convention, and Mark Hanna had his candidate for vice president, but Teddy Roosevelt had other ideas. When he seconded the nomination of William McKinley for President of the United States, he gave a speech that was so moving that the convention delegates stormed behind Roosevelt's banner and the next night put him on the ticket for Vice President of the United States. In the election that followed, McKinley and Roosevelt were elected and, Ro and Roosevelt was sworn in in March of 1901 as the Vice President of the United States. In September of 1901, William McKinley, a attended a world exposition in Buffalo, New York. That's why you shouldn't go to Buffalo. A man named Scholgoltz had his arm in a sling, and he was in the reception line, and he eventually worked his way up to President McKinley. And when he reached out with his left hand to shake hands with President McKinley, he shot McKinley three times uh, with the gun that was hidden in his sling. McKinley died a few days later, and Theodore Roosevelt became President of the United States, much to the horror of Mark Hanna. One of the things that Roosevelt wanted to do as a, rep as a progressive Republican was implement campaign reform. And he began to work on it, but it would take him quite a while. Eventually, he was re-elected uh, President in 1904, and then he settled the um, Japanese-Russian War and won the Nobel P Peace Prize for that. And so by 1906, he had enormous credibility, and he was finally able to get, in 1907, the first campaign reform legislation passed. This legislation is known as the Tillman Act. It was written by a popular senator from South Carolina named Pitchfork Ben Tillman. He's one of my favorite characters. Uh, it was the first campaign reform since 1867, which followed the Civil War, and Congress prohibited federal candidates from soliciting funds from government workers in armed services yards, like the Navy Yard or the Army barracks or wherever. They were prohibited from soliciting support from those people. Uh, Roosevelt then decided that he would follow tradition that was established by George Washington and not run for a third term. His hand-picked successor was William Howard Taft, who'd been the governor of the Philippines, the islands we took over after the Spanish-American War. But Taft turned out to be a little more pro-business than Roosevelt had been. Nonetheless, under William Howard Taft, uh, the Republicans passed the Corrupt Practices Act of 1910, uh, which required state political parties to disclose their contributions to campaigns for the House of Representatives. So this was the first time that you had to say who was giving you money. And that's been a, controversy, a controversial issue ever since, uh, which we'll cover a little bit later on. In 1911, the law was extended to the United States Senate and to the newly emerging primary campaigns. The progressive movement in America was bipartisan. There were some progressives that were in the Democratic Party. There were some progressives in the Republican Party. But what the agenda of the progressives was, was to clean up the political system. And they were very effective in California. They got the initiative passed, which we have to put up with now. They got the referendum passed, which we have to put up with. And you have the right to recall the governor or even uh, a member uh, of the California Supreme Court. So that's what the progressives were all about, and that led to primary campaigns also. Instead of parties selecting their nominees at conventions, some states decided to hold open primaries and elect their candidates that way, and the new law signed into effect in 1911 affected contributions for primaries. In 1921, in Newberry versus the United States, however, the Supreme Court struck down the 1911 extensions of the law. 
said they were unconstitutional, they were interfering with people's freedom of expression and their right to assemble, and therefore Congress could not regulate these things. Then came the Teapot Dome scandal. The Teapot Dome was an area of land in Wyoming that was very rich in natural gas and oil. And some members of the Harding administration uh, gave out leases for that land in return for kickbacks and bribes. They were caught, and uh, eventually some of them uh, would, would, uh, would, would go to jail. Uh, the scandal prompted people to consider more campaign reform uh, practices. And so Congress, under the leadership of Senator Thomas Walsh, passed the Federal Corrupt Practices Act of 1925, which required quarterly reports on contributions for more than $100 to and from parties that operated in more than one state. The Supreme Court upheld the law in Burroughs versus the United States in 1934, the same year Congress would pass the equal time and equal access provisions on broadcasters through the newly formed Federal uh, uh, Com uh, Communications Act. This says that if you give a certain amount of news time to one candidate, you have to give a certain amount of news time to another candidate. If you allow a candidate to buy time on your television or radio station, you have to allow the other candidate to buy time. Uh, and this was to try and create a more equal uh, uh, playing field when it came to new media like radio and television. Uh, the Hatch Act was passed in 1939, and it prevented federal employees from participating in political campaigns altogether. So for the first time, if you were appointed to a, uh, a governmental job, you were not allowed to take part in political campaigns. In 1943, the Smith-Conley Act was passed uh, over the, pres uh, over the uh, veto of President uh, Roosevelt. Uh, it prohibited union contributions to federal campaigns. So here was the first prohibition on unions giving monies to campaign, and that came in 1943 during World War II. The Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 reinforced the provisions that applied to the labor unions and restricted them and corporations from making independent contributions to federal campaigns for the first time. So this was a major reform. Not only the unions, but also corporations were restricted in 1947 from contributing uh, to federal campaigns. The various laws were replaced by the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, which brought all of these laws together and strengthened the reporting provisions of the federal, for federal campaigns. Instead of direct contributions from unions and corporations, the law allowed them to form political action committees known as PACs, specifically for the purpose of contributing to federal campaigns. The law allowed citizens to check a box on their income tax return, which would be set aside, uh, which set aside a dollar for the funding of federal campaigns starting in 1976. On June 17, 1972, five bells sounded on the Associated Press ticker in newsrooms around the world. I happened to be working for CBS at the time as a student intern and went running to the uh, Associated Press machine when I heard the five bells. It usually meant disaster. Turned out that the story was a group of men, some with connections to the CIA, had been arrested for breaking into the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. Specifically, the men had entered the offices of the Democratic National Committee in the hotel. These burglars were part of a rogue operation started earlier by the White House to stem leaks to the news media. They were called the plumbers. Nixon and many other candidates enjoyed large contributors that were often untraceable. On, on, on In other cases, such as the $1 million donation uh, to Nixon by millionaire Clement Stone, the campaign contribution cast a shadow of undue influence over the administration. Citing the threat of corruption, the 1974 reforms required that any contributor giving $10 or more to a federal campaign had to be included in the campaign's next quarterly report to the Federal Elections Commission. The name and address of contributors must be listed. The new federal rules limited individual contributions to $1,000 per election per candidate prohibited direct corporate and union contributions, but allowed employees to contribute to a campaign by forming political action committees, or PACs, which could then make a maximum contribution of $5,000 per candidate per election. 
No individual would be allowed to give more than $5,000 to a political action committee or $25,000 overall to federal candidates during a single election cycle. The new law also carefully monitored and limited what corporations or unions could contribute in kind as, as opposed to money. They could give filing cabinets. They could work for the candidate. They could provide uh, lawn signs, travel, that kind of thing. However, for-profit and non-profit organizations under the designations of 501c6, 501c4, and 501c3 by the Internal Revenue Service could provide advocacy advertisements favoring federal candidates or their issue positions, positions as long as those organizations did not coordinate their efforts with the campaign. This is a very touchy legal point. How do you know when they're coordinating and when they're not coordinating? Uh, I could hold a press conference and I could say, well, you know, I, if an independent organization were to make an ad in my favor, I sure, certainly wouldn't object to that. And they might point out these things about my opponent. And then suddenly that ad comes on the air. Is that coordination? Or because I didn't talk directly to them, am I off scot-free uh, under the law? Uh, the new laws of 1974 in reaction to Watergate uh, also allowed for the creation of independent action groups. These are known as 527s under the IRS. They are tax exempt and can raise unlimited amounts of money for political activity and issue advertising. These are the kinds of operations that the Koch brothers have put into effect in Grow America, America Crossroads, and so on and so forth. You hear about these all the time. Two of the most infamous of these action groups may have been the independent group from the 1988 presidential campaign that placed the Willie Horton negative advertisement against Michael Dukakis. Um, the advertisement uh, was about Willie Horton. Michael Dukakis had given him a pardon and let him out of jail. And then Willie Horton, who was a black man, raped a woman and was brought back to jail. So this advertisement was aimed directly at presidential candidate Michael Dukakis by these people uh, this independent group. Um, the other ad that they made is the famous Swift Boat uh, uh, advertisement against John Kerry claiming that he really wasn't a hero in Vietnam. The former advertisement, the, the Willie Horton ad, was created by Floyd Brown for an independent committee called Americans for Bush. In 2004, Brown challenged a documentary made by Michael Moore which was called Fahrenheit 9-11. We'll hear more about that a little later on, but it contained a direct attack on George Bush and cost over $2 million. Uh, Brown complained to the Federal Election Commission that that ad should be stopped because it was issue advocacy that was coordinated. The Federal uh, Election Commission turned him down, and so he decided he would make his own documentary, and he would call it Hillary the Movie, and he would see if he could destroy a presidential campaign with a documentary. And that would lead to the Citizens United case, which is what Brown founded, the Citizens United group. While Citizens United was revving up its operation, the campaign reforms were failing because they were shot through with loopholes. In 2000, for example, over $500 million was spent by 130 independent groups on campaign issue commercials. $500 million in 2000. And while the political parties were forced to allocate their contributions based on uh, population formulas, they could provide unlimited mo money to and in the states for the purpose of party building activities. So if we had a close election in California for Senate, let's say, uh, and I'm head of the uh, National Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, I can't give that candidate beyond the allocated formula that I'm required to uh, limited by. But I could give money to the Republican Party in California and they could then do party building activities, which include going out and registering people to vote for that Senate candidate. So this was another way around uh, everything that, that took place. This provision also opened the law to what is called soft money, unlimited contributions given to the party for party building efforts. Um, the activities were not subject to the limitations of the Federal Election Commission. In return for accepting matching funds, presidential candidates were limited in how much they could spend overall. If they refused matching funds, they could spend all the money they could raise under the new rules. Senator Barack Obama, 
chose this latter course in both of his presidential campaigns. He became the first major pa uh, party candidate to take this course since federal funding was made available in 1976. Obama then raised more money than, uh, from more donors than anyone in history. In 2008, he raised over $750 million from over 305 million reported donors. Senator John McCain, his opponent, accepted federal funding. Thus, following his convention, McCain was limited to spending $84 million that the federal government provided to him, while Barack Obama could spend all that he raised uh, in, in the uh, election campaign, which was $750 million. So he was able to outspend McCain nine to one uh, using the rules the way they came down. Um, all of this was looked at, these campaign reforms were looked at in a decision, a very famous decision that's still uh, precedential, and that was Buckley versus Vallejo. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld the 1974 reforms in a crazy decision that said contributions to candidates are not speech and therefore they can be restricted. The spending of the money, on the other hand, is speech, and therefore it cannot be restricted under freedom of expression and the First Amendment. So money is not speech when you give it to the candidate. Money is speech when the candidate spends it. And that's still the law to this day, which is just bizarre. Um, the confusion and the abuse that followed the ruling led to a new round of reforms instigated by Senator John McCain uh, and Senator Russell Feingold and signed into law by President George W. Bush in 2002. The law raised contribution limits to $2,000 per person per candidate, not to exceed $25,000 for all candidates funded during any calendar year. Reporting to the FEC was now required for those financing advertising for elections in excess of $10,000. The law also required that no party organ could solicit funds from or make donations to any organization that holds charitable or nonprofit status. This provision was aimed at preventing further collaboration between nonprofits and party organs. Other provisions required that no candidate for federal office could receive any funds that did not meet the FECA requirements. Accepting funds from foreign nationals was forbidden. Express advocacy was re redefined as communication that advocates the election or defeat of a candidate containing the phrases vote for, reelect, or words that in that context by a reasonable person could not be understood any other way. The law mandata mandated that if a broadcast appears within 60 days of a federal election and refers to a clearly identifiable candidate, it is considered electioneering communication and prohibited because these ads are tantamount to campaign contributions. The law said that the union members could not be required to pay full union dues if some of those funds were used for political purposes. However, while they did prevent soft money contributions and other dodges, this round of reforms had many flaws. First, the distribution of federal funds favored the two-party system, thereby quashing the voices of third-party candidates. Full matching funds were provided only to those parties that scored 25% of the vote in the presidential election. Worse yet, the law funded the two parties' primary candidates, conventions, and election campaigns while marginalizing third parties and their candidates. Second, by creating joint committees and joint fundraisers, operatives and supporters could raise large sums of money at various gatherings for campaigns. Prior to the Republican convention of 2008, the developer Alex Spanos, who owns the San Diego Chargers, provided over 85,000 to the McCain campaign using this tactic uh, prior to the Republican convention. The family of Carl Polad, the owner of the Minnesota Twins, provided $170,000 to the Obama campaign under the same scheme. Third, to require disclosure of membership in an organization may be a violation of the rights of privacy and assembly, and at least one justice on the Supreme Court, Justice Thomas, agrees with that opinion. Fourth, the reform favored incumbents since they don't need to spend money to attain name identification with voters and their opponents usually do. The less money available to candidates, the more incumbents have the advantage. So this law really could be called the two-party reelect the incumbents law. Senator Mitch McConnell, 
head of the Republican National Senatorial Campaign Committee, sought to weaken the McCain-Feingold law by pointing out its unconstitutional problems. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court upheld many of the provisions when it took the law up in McConnell versus the Federal Elections Commission in 2003. The McConnell ruling, mainly crafted by Justice Stevens and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, was only uh, uh, one, only five to four. The number of concurring comments took the ruling to 275 pages, wherein past arguments regarding P Buckley again surfaced. The history of the attempts at campaign finance reform is important because it reveals the fears that motivated both campaign reformers and First Amendment advocates. Reformers feared influence peddling by donors, overwhelming monetary advantages on the campaign playing fields, and the appearance of corruption in the political system. First Amendment advocates feared closing down the free marketplace of ideas due to the, construction of, uh, the uh, constriction of campaign voices and the denial of voters' rights to hear political messages from multiple sources. These fears on each side would be reflected in the opinions of the justices in the Citizens United decision. And so let me turn this over to Dr. Kevin Johnson to report on the Citizens United case. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. As I noted last year in my same-sex marriage uh, uh, cases uh, discussion on Constitution Day, the Constitution works in mysterious, in mysterious ways. It is active, contested, messy. We like it when it's convenient to our political ideology, and we negate it and try to get it to say what we want when it's not convenient to our political ideology. And so it is suitable that on Constitution Day we be celebrated by engaging in thoughtful consideration of the impact of contemporary First Amendment rulings on our democratic elections. So I'd like to begin, the purpose of this presentation today is to share with you some of the complexities of the current cases, some of the issues that are involved in those cases, and then maybe some of the impacts and, and, and discussions that have occurred in the context of our current elections. So let's begin with the most popular case that Dr. Smith discussed. Citizens United. That case all begins with Michael Moore, who prior to, just prior to the 2004 election was able to uh, release his Fahrenheit 9-11 in theaters. Citizens United was a conservative group, is a conservative group, that was fairly outraged that this kind of advertisement they thought that was anti-George W. Bush in an election could be broadcast in violation of what they saw in the McCain-Feingold rules, which is an issue advocacy in the time immediately before the election. So they filed a complaint to the Federal Elections Commission. The Federal Elections Commission ruled in favor of Michael Moore. Citizens United partially based their argument with the fact that this was uh, corporate speech in, 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 a, in a pure sense. This, the film was put out by Miramax Pictures, uh, which is a, subset, a subsidiary of the Disney Corporation at the time and was widely distributed amongst the American public to be able to hear arguments against George W. Bush and his handling of the Iraq War. Federal Elections Commission ruling in favor of Michael Moore and Fahrenheit 9-11 then prompted Citizens United to create their own movie to be able to say, if Michael Moore can make a movie against George W. Bush, then surely we should be able to make an, a movie against Hillary Clinton and release it within the same time period as Michael Moore did with Fahrenheit 9-11. So they created the, the Hillary movie, the, the documentary. And the, the Federal Elections Commission then received complaints that this was in violation of the rules, and they held in favor of the, of the provision, saying that indeed Citizens United had violated the rules for issue advocacy and advocacy against the candidate. Citizens United, of course, was outraged. They felt like they were being mistreated because the same principles that were upheld for Michael Moore were not the same principles that they were being upheld with the Hillary Clinton documentary. So what, they, what did they do? Like all good Americans, they sued and they brought it into the court system. In which case, it made it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Citizens United. 
part of my study and the way that judicial interpretations fall down is one of the things that most conservative justices are absolutely opposed to is when administrators apply the law in two disparate ways when it comes to different political beliefs. So it's not surprising to me then at the time they would rule in favor of Citizens United saying the Federal Elections Commission had applied a standard unfairly. So the major precedent that it was established in the Citizens United case was that corporations and unions may now spend unlimited amounts of money in political campaigns to be able to advocate on behalf of particular candidates that they like or dislike in an election. Two years later, in Western Tradition Partnership versus Montana, the Supreme Court reaffirmed its decision in Citizens United. In 2011, the Montana Supreme Court had ruled that Citizens United did not apply to Montana because of their unique history of corruption. At the turn of the 20th century, over 100 years ago, the state of Montana in the United States was known for what has been dubbed the War of the Copper Kings. The, the state of Montana had this War of the Copper Kings between three known Copper Kings, namely F. Augustus Hines, William Andrews Clark, and Marcus Daly. This drew the ear of President Theodore Roosevelt and was able to pass the, the, the provision against the corruption. Just to give a, a quick example of the type of corruption that led to the passing of the laws in Montana. Uh, F. Augustus Hines would spend unlimited amounts of money to get his people elected to judicial posts, most notably the district court judges in Butte. Hines got Judge Clancy and Judge Harney elected so that those two judges could control the court's docket in the Butte District Court by outvoting the third judge. These two judges then resided over every case involving Hines and not only ruled in favor of Hines in every case, but made each of the cases drag out for long periods of time where Hines had the power already because a case could not be appealed until a judgment was rendered. So basically, Hines could encroach on somebody else's property, mine the copper there. The people who owned that property and had claim to it would file suit saying that the mining of that copper was not legally bound because it wasn't his land to be able to mine. And the, it would go through the court system. The judges would sit on the case for a long period of time because then it couldn't be appealed and all the copper could be extracted before the case could be held. Then they would rule in favor of Hines and if they wanted to appeal, the copper would already be out of the ground and it wouldn't be an issue, right? So this is the kind of thing that Montana citizens became kind of fed up with. So they passed the Corrupt Practices Act of 1912 to explicitly prohibit any corporate expenditures in political campaigns. That statute was largely successful and led to non-Copper King affiliated candidates to be elected to office and to um, minimize the amount of corruption in Montana politics. So that law would remain on the books until 2012 after Citizens United. Montana's Supreme State Supreme Court said that we do have actual corruption in part of our history. So this law isn't applicable to the, the Citizens United case that talks about the appearance of corruption or the potential of corruption. Montana's our state uh, Supreme Court, their argument was, we've actually had corruption and that's why we have this law on the books and so Citizens United doesn't apply to us. Supreme Court disagreed, tossed out the Fair Practices Act and so Citizens United does apply to the state of Utah. Consistent with the court's ruling in Citizens United and Western Tradition Partnership, the court ruled earlier this year in McCutcheon versus Federal Election Commission that aggregate levels on the amount of individual may contribute cannot be restricted. In this case, Sean McCutcheon con uh, had contributed a total of $33,000 to 16 candidates for federal office in the 2012 election cycle and said he wanted to give $1,776 each to 12 more candidates, but was stopped by the overall cap for individuals. The court then ruled in his favor, saying that you can't cap the number of, of, uh, of candidates that you can support in an election. So effectively allowing McCutcheon to give the amount of money for, spread amongst all the candidates that McCutcheon wanted to be able to give. So these are the three major cases that have come before the court. Citizens United, the Western Tradition Partnership, and McCutcheon. So these are, this is kind of where we stand today. So now that we understand those three cases, 
I'd like to note some of the major issues and points of contention concerning the decisions. In risking oversimplification, I would summarize the major differences of opinion as stemming from differences over three things. The first of which has to do with the, uh, with the idea of corruption or the appearance of corruption. The second of which has to do with the, the, the challenge to democratic participation in the context of our current election system. And then finally, it has to do with issues of freedom of the press, an idea that hasn't gained much circulation, but is certainly important to those members of the press in the context of the current arguments. So the, 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 the first area, the concern with corruption, is usually voiced with conflicting reasons. Those concerned with corruption cite instances where dollars are exchanged for political favor. Such a concern with Citizens United might cite the Montana judges in the Copper King era as a prime example of the kind of corruption that occurs when money supports judiciary elections. Those that are less concerned with corruption tend to be concerned with actual corruption rather than the hypothetical. Under such interpretation, they might find that the corrupt practices in Montana, or the seemingly corrupt practices, that, as they would cite, are, are not actionable because there's, there's not necessarily this direct uh, correlation, uh, that one doesn't necessarily influence the other. And in fact, they would privilege the idea of synergy, right? That they're supporting judges who are already ideologically aligned with them, and that's what is able to be done in an election. You're not going to give money to people who don't have this and share the same kind of political ideology and belief. The answer then, of course, is that the, in Citizens United, in the majority opinion, they cite the idea that maybe in the Montana case of the Copper Kings, you can document some of the real corrupt practices that happen. And if that's what's going on in the era of super PACs, then indeed nothing has changed. Of course, the evidentiary standard on the other side would say that that is a very difficult evidentiary standard to be able to meet. The second area of contention then involves the effect of Citizens United on democratic participation. For example, those in favor of monetary caps argue that when money equals speech, those with less money get less speech. That's the very basic kind of argument. If I am not a millionaire and I can only donate $50 to a campaign and somebody has a million dollars, they can effectively make my voice meaningless in the sea of democratic participation. Those who are in favor of money equaling speech argue that people should be able to express themselves as groups with whatever resources they accumulate. So assemblies, the freedom of assembly is to get together with groups of people and to be able to publish an opinion based on what that group wants to be able to use their resources to be able to do. The other argument that they raise is that the percentage of money donated compared to overall worth uniquely expresses the degree of support an individual gives a candidate. That is, if a, per if a person gives 50% of their net worth to a candidate and another person gives 5% of their net worth to a candidate, then the person who is giving 50% of their net worth might be expressing just how important that candidate is to them, even though that 5% donation might be more in terms of the overall net value. The thing that the, if a billionaire is contributing $1 million, then maybe the net overall effect of the way that they're expressing their support is very small. So the third area of contention is that in the realm of freedom of, of, of the press, and here is where we get less discussion. Most of our press today is in the corporate form. And it is a long-held tradition in freedom of press that editorials and viewpoints be protected by the First Amendment. This was Justice Kennedy's unique contribution to the Citizens United decision. Justice Kennedy argued that in our current climate, Fox News Corporation, all the other different news organizations are now corporations. And to limit what they can spend on getting their editorials to the public is a direct infringement on the freedom of the press. Because traditionally, press organizations are able to do just that, press political candidates based on their ideologies. And if you limit the amount of money that they're able to spend, maybe their editorials don't get aired and broadcast in major primetime networks because they simply cannot spend the resources that they otherwise would in previous elections.
So people who are concerned with the free press are therefore skeptical of restricting media institutions in terms of the amount of money that they're allowed to spend on their editorial speech. And so these are the three major kind of points of contention that have boiled to the surface in the post-Citizens United kind of era. And how do you go about creating the legal standard that would be appropriate to ensure democratic deliberation and balance that with freedom of the press issues and so forth? And that's why we've gotten a lot of discussion about constitutional amendments and things of that nature. So highlighting some of the issues, I'd like to turn toward an explanation of some of the observations regarding what I would consider some of the current impacts of these decisions on our midterm elections. First, there's, there's been little impact so far in the race between Democratic and Republican candidates for president. President Obama was outspent in the last election, but he won the election. That's not to say that there's no impact. In fact, in the, there can be an impact at the primary level when candidates are fizzing out of races because they don't have the monetary support to keep them in. In fact, if we take a look at what happened with, uh, with Newt Gingrich, for example, he was able to stay in the race for a long period of time because of the contributions of one financial backer, Sheldon Alderson, Alderson who was able to, Adelson, sorry, who was able to give a lot of money to be able to keep Newt Gingrich in the race, okay? What that did was significant. Most of the reports at the time were indicating that Newt Gingrich's attacks on his former or on his fellow Republican candidates were more likely to stick to every other single candidate except Mitt Romney. Every attack that Newt Gingrich would level against another Republican opponent, the public seemed to resonate with. They seemed to delegitimize them and their candidacy. And Mitt Romney was the one then that was able to benefit from the long-term impact of keeping Newt Gingrich in the race based on that financial contribution because those attacks were more powerful to his opponents. You see how that works, right? So the second thing, the, the second uh, issue on the local elections is, is really important to keep an eye on. So we, ha we have our local elections where there's not necessarily traditionally big money and, and in particularly the judgeships. So we don't really know the impact of this large money and how, what it's going to have on the local elections. We'll have some insight into that in the midterms. An important point to note, however, is that the control group is really difficult here. It's not like money has never been a part of politics. And Dr. Smith identified a, a large history of big donations to, to politicians to be able to keep uh, money in the races. So it's hard to kind of control for that variable when it comes to our current uh, election cycle. The third thing to look out for is the potential influence on our elections by international sources. Now, this is something that has created a lot of attention based on President Obama's remarks in the State of the Union address, where, Alito, where Justice Alito said, that's not true, right, about the foreign interests. It's true that in Citizens United, it doesn't include uh, or that foreign corporations can't contribute money. But it doesn't say anything about the role of foreign investors as stakeholders in American corporations that are being spending money in American elections. So one thing to keep, keep in, in, in mind here is that if you have some powerful investors in American corporations that are not American citizens, all of a sudden you have a tremendous amount of influence potential from outside uh, sources where the money is able to be put into the American democratic system. So that's also something to, to keep our eye on. The fourth is the way that money may frame the front runners in the elections. We've already seen the dominant media frames reporting on the amount of money raised as a determining factor for finding out who the front runners are. Arguably, this was the case before the Supreme Court rulings, but when we, when we take a look at the amount of money raised, notice that a lot of the news reports talk about the amount of money raised, the amount of money raised, the amount of money raised, right? This candidate raised this, right? And implicitly, this seems to be communicating who the front runners are, right? So in that sense, we, we should keep an eye on the way that this, that, this, uh, that this media attention frames the importance of that money. We can also uh, look in that same context about the role of money in creating front runners. Prior to Citizens United, one case that, that we should look at about the impact is the campaign of Ross Perot, right? 
Ross Perot had independent contributions, spent millions on a political, uh, on a political campaign, was more successful than many of our third party candidates have been for many, many years. Uh, and, and so the money that is, that is in campaigns, like I said, is not anything really new in that regard. The fifth thing to, to watch out for, in my opinion, is whether or not there's a threshold where money matters, but Uber money does not, right? That at what point does enough become enough, right? I mean, so somebody gets $200 million and another person gets $300 million. Does that mean that they're $100 million more likely to win an election? Or does that mean that the $200 million could be spent more effectively and wisely and that you get more savvy political campaigns? Just because somebody is outspent doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to win an election. And so uh, there is a certain threshold at which it takes to be a valid candidate, but exactly what that threshold is in, in order to meet is, is still kind of out for the jury to decide. So there's many issues to kind of pay attention to when we're talking about the impacts that this could have on our elections. So the purpose of my presentation was to share with you some of the issues pertaining to the recent Supreme Court rulings. I did that by explaining the current cases, some of the issues and contentions, the major arguments, some of the issues to look out for in our current elections. I'd like to conclude with contextualizing this controversy within the larger political landscape. Voter turnout remains low and government literacy remains low. Two thirds of the American public cannot name a single Supreme Court justice. Only 1% of Americans can name all nine Supreme Court justices. More people know President Obama than the justices that can overrule any law that he signs into action. One of the important tasks that we have as educators is to instill a degree of civic literacy as the precursor for engagement and participation. We can ask people to vote, but if people don't know what to vote about, then I think that we are failing in our task as educators. One cannot understand the Constitution without having as much knowledge about the Supreme Court as we do about the President. The Supreme Court is, after all, where the business of the Constitution gets done. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, let me remind you that we have some of our publications on the table over there. One of the publications talks about the First Amendment rights of advertisers, and that's an important issue uh, that came up in Citizens United. One of the things you heard about the case was that Citizens United, for the first time, gave corporations rights that belong to humans uh, and treated uh, corporate entities as if they were human. Uh, that's not true. Um, there were a number of cases much earlier that have given corporations the same rights uh, as individual citizens have. Fourteenth Amendment rights in particular, uh, equal protection under the law, due process of the law have been applied to corporations. Uh, and then in the middle of the 70s, there were a string of cases where advertisers were given First Amendment rights. Uh, in 1943, the Supreme Court issued a ruling in Valentine versus Christensen that commercial speech was secondary and therefore could be restricted. In the 1970s, the Supreme Court came back and said that was incorrect. Commercial speech is as important as political speech. Commercial speech, advertising, educates people about products. It can help them decide what to buy, and therefore it's protected under the First Amendment. And so corporations were given First Amendment rights very heavily in, in, in the 1970s. So when everyone was like surprised that this happened in Citizens United, it was because they had no context of precedential rulings by the Supreme Court. So um, that, that brings us up to the current time. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If any of you had a question, uh, Kevin and I would be happy uh, to answer it. We were that lucid and clear. Yes, sir. One point uh, that's expressed in the textbook that I use in my political science 100 class is that the cost of running for election keeps going up. Uh, I think the figure was the average uh, Senate campaign uh, costs fourteen thousand three hundred dollars a day for two years. And the question is, well, how do you get that? I, I'm, I'm wondering whether 
much of that money is spent on advertisements and on TV. But I'm wondering whether the growing importance of the internet as a way of uh, cultivating support may change that a little bit. Maybe the, maybe the cost of using the internet is smaller than the cost of using newspapers. Um, what would you guys think? Yeah, I think, I think you make a very important point. Uh, uh, the, the question revolves around the rising cost of political campaigns, which have really gotten out of hand. I mean, they're outrageously expensive. And maybe one of the good things about social media is it will reduce cost and further de de democratize uh, the, the, the whole uh, system. Uh, every election cycle, people get more and more clever about using social media and get more and more people involved through social media. One of the great successes of the Obama campaigns was their involvement with social media and bringing young people into those campaigns. One of the results of that, of course, is when Barack Obama isn't running, then the vote turnout goes down and uh, uh, in the off years you get uh, you know, the, the other party winning. Uh, but I think that's something we should monitor and look at closely and see how social media uh, can mediate and maybe overcome some of the advantages that people have. The other point I would make, uh, and, and uh, Kevin talked about this a little bit also, is that the lower down the scale the election is, that is the further down the ticket, like assemblyman instead of state senator, the more the money matters because you're not as well known. And so if you can get a lot of money and get your name out there, that, that will help you. So the impact of money on assembly and state senate seats is much bigger than the impact of money on a senate race, where we tend to pay more attention to who the candidates are, or the governor's race, where we tend to pay more attention, and certainly uh, the presidential race. One company, who shall not go unnamed, Sears, um, had a strategy a while back, when I worked in Washington, D.C., of picking out kind of stars in the assembly and the state senate and putting their money there and nurturing that candidate along uh, until they became a senator and a governor. Uh, and and uh, uh, I thought that that was a very clever strategy on the part of Sears, and it worked very well for them. Yeah. I'll say that the, the tricky thing about the internet is to create kind of the right kind of viral video, if you will, right? Um, in order for a third party to kind of eke its way in there, it has to get circulation somehow, right? And so. I think that the, the internet may play a, a role in that. I think that we're just kind of in our infancy here about overruling a lot of these acts and provisions that have been in place. And I think that just as the, the Fair Practices and Anti-Corruption Act in Montana in the early 1900s, I, I can see a similar swing eventually happening and outrage kind of happening where where politicians that are that are really savvy, it's, a, it's not easy, but politicians that are really savvy with using the internet and creating kind of viral videos that put them into that spotlight and then are able to capitalize on that kind of momentum, that may be the possibility because then you're not talking about raising that those tremendous amounts of money and getting the huge super PAC money. And in fact, that becomes the campaign strategy, right? And I know that amending the constitution seems like a pipe dream and that the recent efforts to be able to amend the constitution in this matter have not gone, have failed, right? There's been a lot of failed attempts to be able to do that recently. But I'd also like to remind you that the first amendment of the constitution originally conceived, because our first amendment is actually the third amendment in the constitution, that failed too and was recently ratified. And so I don't think that just because something fails initially that it won't maybe eventually become the case. It seems to be the sentiment of Americans that we don't really like the idea that money equals speech and we don't really like the idea that it might influence the outcome of elections. And I think that's part of what the democratic literacy is all about. The, the, the amendment that failed was an amendment that said Congress could not give itself a raise in that session, that they had to wait till the new Congress came in to give themselves a raise. And that amendment was written by James Madison. So James Madison wrote the official First Amendment to the Constitution, which is freedom of expression and freedom of religion and freedom to assemble. And he wrote the most recent amendment to the Constitution, which is kind of amazing because there was no time on it. Professor Martinez, you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about Concern 
foreign investors in a corporation that could, through the mechanisms of the corporation exerting influence on American elections, I, was, I wanted to ask, are there mechanisms in place or do we have to, uh, let's say, develop such mechanisms to regulate uh, completely foreign operations that have access through the internet into the U.S. media markets because there really is no border any longer with regard to campaign advertisements that flow on the internet. And uh, this, this raises the specter of completely foreign uh, influence inside domestic elections of a country like the United States, or as the United States has done, we have influenced elections in other countries abroad uh, using those same mechanisms. So uh, I'd be interested in your remarks. Yeah, um, why don't you come up here and, and, and follow on. Uh, I think this is one responsibility of the news media, is to report that kind of activity. When we do it in a foreign country, their press should report on it. When they do it in our country, our press should report on it. The other problem you have with foreign influence is they own subsidiaries in this country, and those subsidiaries can contribute to political campaigns. And so they can just flush money into the subsidiaries. The subsidiaries flush the money in, and we've circumvented the law again. Kevin? It's, it's a very important issue and one that I think that it was that Barack Obama was hinting at or it, talking about in the State of the Union. And when he brought up foreign pressures, I don't think that him and Justice Alito were really in disagreement. I think that what, Bar what President Obama was talking about was the influ these, these influence of the foreign investors and what and Justice Alito was talking about was no, in our decision, we said no foreign corporations, right? So I think that they were just kind of not really talking at each other on that point. Um, I think that the, that the point is particularly impactful when we take a look at, say, for example, a lot of Americans that are invested in British Petroleum, right? So a lot of Americans that are interested in BP, BP is not an American corporation, right? Lots of British people are, in, are invested in American corporations. I think that one of the, this, I, again, I really come back to the, the, the government literacy here because part of understanding that government literacy is to understand the role of the corporation as it's changed today. This idea of the American corporation is somewhat of a myth in, in terms of how we traditionally conceive it. It used to be the case where the investors in these corporations were predominantly American citizens, but the nature of the multinational markets have shifted and changed and were subject to these global economic forces. Do we want that? Do we need that? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a pretty educated person and I have a hard time tracking the flow of all of this information. I don't know what hope the kind of average person would have that doesn't have access to these research databases that I have to try to figure this out. I mean, it's a really complicated issue. Yeah. Could I raise one more point about uh, in, that, in that regard? And that is, during the investigations of the economic crash of 2008, a lot of attention was focused on corporations such as Standard & Poor that were giving uh, recommendations on whether or not certain stocks, other equities, were actually uh, worthwhile investments. And they claimed that their advice who was not uh, liable for enforcement under these provisions because it was First Amendment freedom that Standard & Poor's had to make these kinds of advice and that the purchasers were doing so also under the, uh, presumably a First Amendment. And so how is the First Amendment being warped now by corporations uh, attempting to use a constitutional mechanism out of the 18th century for purposes of global capitalism today in a way that circumvent any nation's economic regulation? Let me make two quick points because we have to give up the room. But uh, the first point is that Justice Kennedy, in, in his writing, says the public has a right to know. He's very often not giving a corporation any right. He is reinforcing the public's right to know and keeping that marketplace open. And so that, that's the argument on, on, on that side. The second point I, I, I want to leave you with is this decision was only five to four. If you change one justice on, on the court, they can revisit this and flip it again, uh, which will thoroughly confuse the political process. Um, but for those of you who didn't like the Citizens United ruling, there's hope in the valley. I think Thank the mandatory disclosure requirement right. needs to be solidified. 
right now? Well, they, they can reform mandatory disclosures. There's, there's all kinds of ways of, of working on it. But reform, is, as you point out, is certainly necessary. And thank you for that comment. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll see you next year. Mm -hmm.